والله يدعو الى دار السلام ويهدي من يشاء الى صراط مستقيم الله نزل احسن الحديث كتابا متشابها كتابا متشابها مثانية قشعر منه جلود الذين يخشون ربهم ثم تلين جلودهم وقلوبهم إلى ذكر الله السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته I welcome you to an episode of our new and exciting series called The Sciences of the Qur'an. I am your host, Yasir Qaldi. We were talking in our last episode about the history of uh, the sciences of the Qur'an and we mentioned that, like all the sciences of Islam, these sciences were initiated with the Prophet ﷺ himself and the companions would ask the Prophet ﷺ of any issues that confused them, they needed any clarification of. And some of the companions began to specialize in the sciences of the Qur'an. Just like other companions began to specialize in what would later be called fiqh, and yet other companions specialized in other topics. So these specializations actually began with the companions themselves. So we had, for example, Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu ta'ala an, who was the cousin of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He was of the most knowledgeable of the companions about, about the Qur'an. And one of the reasons this was the case is because the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam made a dua for him and said, Allahumma faqihu fi deen wa alimhu ta'wil. O oh Allah, give him a knowledge of the religion and teach him how to interpret the Qur'an. So when the Prophet ﷺ made this dua, and he was at that time 13 years old, then by the time he became a man, by the time he became uh, an older person, he was considered to be the single most knowledgeable person of the companions about the Qur'an and the sciences of the Qur'an and interpreting the Qur'an. Other famous companions were Abdullah ibn Mas'ud. Ibn Mas'ud radiallahu ta'ala anhu memorized so many verses and surahs from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam himself. He said, for example, in one narration, I memorized over 70 verses directly from the mouth of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. 70 surahs, 70 chapters. And that is more than half the Qur'an. I memorized 70 surahs directly from the mouth of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And many other companions, uh, Ibn Mas'ud also for example said, ask me about any verse in the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and I will be able to tell you whether it was revealed during night or day, whether it was revealed in this part or that part, Mecca or Medina, I will be able to tell you why it was revealed and what it means. And another famous companion that knew the Qur'an very well and understood the science of the Qur'an is Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu ta'ala an, yet another cousin of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And of course, all of the companions knew uh, portions here and there, knew bits and pieces, but as we said, some specialized in certain sciences more than others. So throughout the centuries, the science of the Qur'an began to then be compiled into book form. And we find even references to books being written down in the later part of the first century of the Hijrah. And in the second century for sure we have references. In fact, we even have extant manuscripts dating back to the second century of the Hijrah about books written on the Qur'an, explaining the Qur'an, talking about the Qur'an, contextualizing the revelation of certain verses. And slowly but surely, this became a separate science of Islam, just like all the other sciences became separate sciences, like we have in our times, fiqh and tafsir and hadith and aqidah and all of these sciences. The sciences of ulum al-Qur'an or the sciences of the Qur'an also became a separate chapter. And of the greatest books ever written uh, in this field, as a very famous book uh, by a person called Badr al-Din al-Zarkashi, and it is called Al-Burhan Fi Ulum Al-Qur'an, and this is written in the 8th century of the Hijrah, and this is a uh, book which is in many volumes, and it is considered to be the most encyclopedic work in which he compiled many of the works before him. And a later scholar came along by the name of Jalal al-Din al-Suyuti, who died 911 Hijrah, and he wrote a book which was based upon a Zarkashis, he summarized it and he added other opinions to it, and this is also, if you like, the second most standard reference to uh, the Ulum al-Qur'an, and that is the book called Al-Itqan Fi Ulum al-Qur'an. Now of course these books are in, are in Arabic, and there are many books uh, in English as well. There is a book by 
uh, a very famous convert to Islam by the name of Ahmed von Denfer called An Introduction to the Sciences of the Quran. And this is a very simple and a very introductory level book about this topic, which uh, is probably the best book to start off with. There is also another book uh, by Dr. Abu Amina Bilal Phillips called An Introduction to the Principles of Tafsir. And this is also a very good book. And I too have written a book which is going to be the basis of these series of lectures that I'm going to do. And it is entitled An Introduction to the Sciences of the Quran. And it is printed in England by Al Hidayah Publications. And this is a book that I will be basing uh, the next series, the next few lectures and series of lectures on from this particular book. So if you get any of these books, you will get a good introduction to the sciences of the Quran. The first actual subject that we will get to what is the meaning of the word? Quran. When we say Quran, 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 what does it mean? What is the actual linguistic meaning of the word Quran? Well, there are a number of opinions. There are some scholars, for example, Imam al-Shafi'i, who claim that this is not a name that has a meaning. It is a proper name. In other words, it's a proper noun that doesn't have any meaning to it. But most of the scholars said, no, the word Quran is derived from a three-letter root. What is that three-letter root? Some scholars said it is from uh, a, uh, uh, the three-letter word, Qarana. And Qarana means to combine, to compile together, to put all of them one after the other. So the Qur'an is that which is compiled together, or that which, whose verses aid and help one another. This is one interpretation, that Qur'an comes from Qarana. Another uh, opinion and this is the more common opinion, and in fact it is uh, probably the correct opinion, is that Qur'an comes from the three-letter verb qara'a, which means to recite. So Qur'an then means the recitation, or that which is recited. And this is the opinion of the vast majority of scholars throughout the centuries, that the meaning of the word Qur'an is the recitation, or that which is recited. And this shows us the oral nature of the Qur'an, that the Qur'an primarily has always been a book that is recited since its very beginning. The first revelation that was, that was revealed was recited. It was not written down for a period of time, for years, but it was recited right then and there. And since its revelation up until our times, the Qur'an is a book that is recited continuously. So the proper meaning of the word Qur'an is the recitation. But when we use it, in our religion, of course, we're referring to a specific book. It's not just any recitation. It is the recitation. And which book are we referring to? Well, we are defining this book as the Qur'an is the Arabic speech of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Qur'an is the Arabic speech of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that He revealed to our Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in wording and in meaning. In other words, the very words are from Allah. It's not just a meaning that comes and then the Prophet expresses it. No, the wording and the meaning comes from Allah and which has been preserved in the mushafs that are famous and well-known throughout the world. And it has reached us by numerous transmissions. Hundreds and thousands of people in every single generation have recited the same Qur'an, the same verses. So it's not as if there's any solitary narration, one person recites it. It has reached us by numerous narrations. And it is a challenge to mankind to produce something similar to it. This is the definition of the Qur'an. Let us break down this definition bit by bit. The first thing that we said, the Qur'an is the Arabic speech of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Therefore, according to this first part of the definition, the Qur'an is the Arabic. In other words, if we were to translate the Qur'an, we don't have the Qur'an anymore, we have a translation of the Qur'an. The Qur'an is only in Arabic, and anything that is translated based upon the meanings is not the actual Qur'an. Hence, we cannot recite a translation in the prayer. We cannot derive rulings from translations. We cannot derive legislation or theology from translations. Yes, we may read translations to get a very basic meaning, but we cannot use translations as a substitute for the original. And this is not the case in other religions. For example, Christianity, all Christians of our times, all of them rely upon 
translations of the Bible and they consider those translations to be the very Bible of God. And yet it is well known that Jesus Christ did not speak Latin, nor did he speak Greek, nor even did he of course not speak English or Spanish or any of these uh, translations that are available. And yet many Christians will believe that the, that the translated Bible is the actual Word of God. Whereas the prophet that they believe in, the prophet Jesus Christ, never spoke any of these languages. For us, we say no, the Quran is only in the language it came down in. And that is the language of Arabic. And anything that is translated is only a translation of the meanings of the Quran and not the actual Quran itself. And the evidence for this is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself refers to the Quran as being in Arabic in over 12 verses in the Quran. One of them, for example, Allah says, وَهَذَا لِسَانٌ عَرَبِيٌّ مُبِينٌ And this is a clear and perfect Arabic speech. In another verse, Allah says, إِنَّا أَنزَلْنَاهُ قُرْآنًا عَرَبِيًّا We have revealed it as the Arabic Quran. And also Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in many other verses that this is the Arabic speech. Now, question arises here. If it is the Arabic speech of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, does this mean that each and every word in the Quran is a pure Arabic word? And if this is the case, then what do we do for those words that clearly, if you specialize in Arabic, you realize these are not words that will have an Arabic origin. They are based in original languages and were imported into Arabic. For example, the word qistas. Qistas, which is the same word uh, from it we get the English word justice. For example, asatir, the same word we get the English word stories. These words are not originally Arabic words. What do we do when we find these words in the Quran? The response is that these words were originally borrowed from other languages centuries before the revelation of the Quran. And like any language, words come in from other languages and become a part of the language, even if they are not based upon that language. English is no exception. English is composed of many different languages. Sometimes a new term will be borrowed from another language and it becomes a part and parcel of it, even though its origin is somewhere else. Similarly, the Quran contains certain words that come from other languages, but the Arabs took them, the Arabs adopted them, the Arabs Arabicized them, they made the letters Arabic, they used these words in their poetry. So for practical purposes, these words became Arabic in and of themselves, even though their origins were not Arabic. And this is the correct opinion that there are indeed some words whose origin is in a foreign language, but when they have been transformed into the Arabic letters and they have been adopted by the Arabs, then these words became Arabic and a knowledge of these words was necessary for a knowledge of Arabic. If you didn't know these words, then you weren't knowledgeable of Arabic. And this appears to be the strongest opinion. So to summarize today's episode, the meaning of the word Qur'an is that which is recited. And of the definitions of the Qur'an, and we'll talk about this in more detail in our next episode, is that the Qur'an is the Arabic speech of Allah. It must be in Arabic. Any translation of the Qur'an is not the actual Qur'an. Therefore, the translation can never take the place of the original. This doesn't mean that every single word is a pure Arabic word. Some words have been taken from other languages and adopted by the Arabs and the Quran came down when it was already adopted by the Arabs and it used them in its revelation. This brings us to the conclusion of today's episode. I hope to see you next time. Until then, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. الله نزل أحسن الحديث كتابا متشابها كتابا متشابها مثانية قشعر منه جلود الذين يخشون ربهم ثم تلين جلودهم وقلوبهم إلى ذكر الله